Welcome to uh, this morning's quarterly economic briefing for quarter three, Greater Manchester Chamber of Commerce uh, quarterly economic survey results. I'm also going to be having a look uh, at a few other things as well, obviously on the back of the announcement from the Chancellor Rishi Sunak yesterday on the uh, winter economy plan. Um, it's obviously a time of, of huge change and upheaval and you start off the week working on one set of rules and you can very easily finish the, the end of the week working on something completely different. Uh, obviously, like I said yesterday, we heard from the Chancellor on his idea and plans uh, for what happens after furlough and what's going to be going on over the next six months. We heard from the Prime Minister this week as well over the seriousness of, of the situation that we are facing and obviously what the economic impact of that is going to be. And we're also going to be facing as well some potential changes uh, to whatever the local lockdown measures are going to be as well. Every, every likelihood uh, that Wigan and Stockport uh, will be put back under the rest of Greater Manchester when it comes to measures and we'll keep our eyes and ears open if anything gets announced uh, while we're doing the event today. If not, that will probably come through later on this afternoon. So a time of huge change, huge challenges. Uh, but one thing that is absolutely consistent in this is the ability and the engagement of businesses, our members and other businesses in Greater Manchester to tell us uh, through the quarter economic survey what the current situation actually is. And remember, this isn't three month old data that comes out from government announcements. This was data that was as live as last week. So it really is as near to real time as you're probably ever going to get. So this is finger on the pulse time for what's actually happening here in Greater Manchester with the local economy. So without any further ado, what I'll do is now I'll hand over to Subra, our head of research, uh, to take you through the findings of the latest economic survey uh, and do the economic briefing and update. Subra, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, it's it's a great to have you here. Uh, these are strange times, I fully understand. Um, and so, you know, something that I say yesterday is no longer relevant today, and something that I say today is maybe no longer relevant on uh, Monday, but we will see. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, quarterly economic survey for the third quarter, uh, some very interesting insights here. What I want to do is not just present the quarterly economic survey data, I want to bring in the uh, recovery tracker survey data as well the surveys that we have been uh, doing for a very important reason, which I'll get to. When I delivered uh, the last quarter's QES presentation in June, I said that it would perhaps be one of the most important of my lifetime and probably you know, our lifetimes. Uh, but COVID being the one gift that you do not want, uh, but being the gift that keeps on giving, it seems, uh, we, you know, we continue to live in strange uh, times. Uh, we have a protracted uh, economic crisis like no other. And so the prolonged impact of COVID, and of course the small matter of Brexit, which is uh, around the corner, uh, means we have to keep our, you know, very clear uh, on what the economic activity levels are uh, like. We have to have, keep a very close eye on the economic data for uh, some more months. And as I have said many times before, uh, please do remember these are your uh, results. And what I am presenting today is uh, based on a data that you have uh, supplied to us. So those of you who responded to the survey, a big thank you. Uh, you know, this is a, a survey, the results of which will have a significant amount of influence on both regional and national uh, economic uh, policy. Um, it is a very important uh, piece of research uh, for that uh, reason. Um, and, you know, Clive, Chris and I um, have constant conversations with both uh, local decision makers and decision makers in Westminster. So it is very important that you continue to contribute uh, to this um, survey. And all I'm doing is uh, kind of replaying some of your uh, comments with added uh, context uh, and commentary. So. Uh, Let's just get on with the uh, slides. So the agenda for today, uh, I'm just going to do the QES presentation and then we will hopefully have enough uh, time for a Q&A session um, and a discussion, of course. So to those of you who are uh, new, and I see some of my academic colleagues from Salford Business School, uh, if uh, you, know, the, you are new to the QES, uh, this is probably the uh, largest and the most reliable business confidence survey. It is, as Chris was saying, the very first to be published in every quarter. The key difference between the QES and national surveys being the quarterly economic surveys field work is carried out in that quarter and the results are published in the same quarter, unlike national data, which is in some cases weeks, in some cases years behind um, schedule. 
Now, the QES also has a good uh, sample size across the uh, country. We get six to 7,000 responses every quarter. In Greater Manchester, we uh, usually get about 400 responses. We had just over 400 responses um, this quarter. So the fact that the response rate is good, the response rate comes from uh, businesses, et cetera, makes this survey very reliable. And it has accurately predicted the recessions of the 1990s, the 2000s, the double dip recession. It proved that there was no double dip recession in 2012 and so on. And because of all of these reasons and the fact that this is the first real economic data set to be published in a quarter, uh, it is routinely used by policymakers, including the Bank of England, uh, Treasury, and various other multinational organizations. And so in terms of the actual briefing today, I want to cover um, the Greater Manchester Index, uh, the business confidence data, overseas demand, domestic demand, and some analysis of different sectors, if you are interested in a regional breakdown of the data, the regional breakdown is available. And then we will look at some aspects of the macroeconomic outlook as well. So if you're wondering what the Greater Manchester Index is, and if it is new to you, this is the single most important economic indicator for our city region. It is based on seven different QES measures, uh, the seven being domestic sales, domestic orders, international sales orders, confidence in turnover, confidence in the business's ability to maintain margins and profitability and capacity utilization. Now, before I get to the data for this quarter, just to recap, where were we in June? Now, in June, uh, we, the, day, the field work for the second quarter's QES was done in May and early June, so it captured the full impact of uh, the uh, lockdown. But just as the QES results were being published, lockdown measures were being relaxed. But the Greater Manchester Index uh, for the second quarter was 31.7, which is the lowest value ever on record. It was a full six points lower than it was at the bottom of the recession in 2008-2009. Now, here is something to remember about the QES. By design, the quarterly economic survey is a quarterly survey. Um, and so it presents a quarterly snapshot in time. However, in times like these, where the economic activity level is constantly changing from one week to the other, uh, we need to have a more reliable and a more real-time uh, source of data, which is where the Greater Manchester Recovery Tracker Surveys uh, fit in. And as you would know, we did the business monitor surveys between late March and early in June. We then had the QES in June. And from the very end of June, we have been doing the Recovery Tracker Surveys every fortnight. And so we have five recovery tracker data sets in addition to the Q, uh, two QES data sets uh, to actually fall back on to understand where Greater Manchester's economy is at the moment, but more importantly, what has changed between June and now. Now, usually at this point, I would uh, reveal the Greater Manchester Index for this quarter, but I'm not going to do that for, uh, for a, a couple of reasons, which I'll get to later. But let's look into the component parts of the Greater Manchester Index. And first up is domestic demand, probably an extremely important economic indicator uh, for uh, this time. Now, if you look into the chart on the left for a moment, what you see is that increase between the second quarter and the third quarter. Now, the depths that we reached in the second quarter, the, the levels were in the minus 30s, and that has not been seen before. And so you have that improvement. But this story is a lot more nuanced um, than that. Now, if you, and, and this is what I uh, want you to bear in mind, the two data points that are presented to us by the two quarterly economic um, surveys give you that snapshot in time, have the evolution between the second quarter and the third quarter, but they do not tell some of the details within that story. And that's where the recovery tracker comes in. So. In the, on the first chart on the left-hand side, you see that increase between the second quarter and the third quarter. So for Greater Manchester as a whole, this is not split by sectors yet. The current sales uh, balance is at minus uh, 15, and the, uh, uh, the current advance orders balance is uh, near uh, minus uh, 20. So that's what we uh, see at the moment. Now, Fine. Is that so? What what is, is that actually um, happened exactly as it is, and it and it hasn't, uh, to be honest. So if you look into the chart on the right hand side, you see the bottom levels, the very low levels, the minus 30s in the second quarter of QES. 
much of the increase took place between June and early in July. And what has happened is since July, things have either remained constant, so there has been a stabilization, I would probably call it a stagnation if things uh, stay this way, uh, but in some cases there has actually been a decline. And so this nuance is extremely important. And what this means is that we, as lockdown measures were being relaxed in June, so do remember when we launched the results, uh, retail stores had just reopened in June, and we were also looking forward to the reopening of the hospitality sector early in July. So it was at that time that the results were being published. So we had that early increase in July, but since then things seem to have either stabilized or uh, declined. And that is not a uh, great news. This means that the recovery from uh, COVID-19 is going to be a long drawn protracted affair. It is not going to happen uh, very quickly, you know, the prospects for a V-shaped recovery, which was talked about, is all gone, but I'll get to the recovery forecast later. But please do bear this in mind. You know, don't be misled by these two data points in the quarterly economic survey, Q2 and Q3 data. Actually, the story is a lot more nuanced uh, than that. Okay, so what does the sectoral picture look like? Now, the sectoral story is uh, somewhat similar. So on domestic sales, uh, all three sector groups, manufacturing, the services group, and construction have seen an increase between the uh, second quarter and the third quarter. But here's the thing, the balances are still uh, pretty much negative. So do bear in mind, there is a zero line here, and uh, we are still not back anywhere near the levels that we had in the pre-pandemic uh, times. For the manufacturing sector, the balance uh, is, is best amongst uh, the three, so it's minus uh, six and a half, uh, but for construction and uh, services is probably doing the worst of the three, as you would expect, with the key uh, worst affected sectors falling within that services group, which is why the services sector balance would, I would expect it to be uh, weak for quite some more months. So this is the domestic sales, so the current uh, sales picture, um, domestic orders, so advanced orders of bookings uh, from customers. Um, again, there has been that slight improvement, but you would also see that the balances are markedly weaker than the current uh, sales balances. Uh, so in the case of manufacturing and construction, it is near minus 17, 16, 17, and then the um, services group doing the worst amongst the three again uh, at minus 22.1. Uh, so that's the domestic uh, demand scenario, extremely important. Now, uh, just do bear in mind one thing. Part of the reason that this rebound has happened is also because of the improvement in uh, retail sales. Uh, again, there is a different story about retail sales, which we will get to uh, later, uh, but the improvement in retail sales and the fact that we had some uh, schemes benefiting the hospitality sector has all played into it. But my response is this, it has had an impact, but it has not had enough of an impact to actually deliver us a recovery from uh, COVID-19. Okay, on to international demand. Again, this picture is very similar. So on the chart to the left, uh, you see that increase between the second quarter and the third quarter. So the export sales balances uh, is at minus 18.9, uh, and then the uh, export orders balances uh, at minus uh, 22. Um, so uh, just a note here, I should have clarified earlier um, as to what we mean by these uh, balances. So except where it is specifically mentioned, QES data is presented as a balance and that balance is the difference between the proportion of the positive response to a particular question and the negative response uh, to that particular question. So in the case of the demand questions, domestic or international, the question would be, uh, in this quarter, did your sales uh, go up, remain the same, or go down? Go up being the positive response, go down being the negative response. And so we use the difference between the proportion of the positive and the negative responses. That's why uh, you get the balances. Uh, this is actually a very accurate way of reflecting uh, the data rather than just using a, using a simple percentage. Okay, so the improvement between the second quarter and the third quarter in both export sales and export orders. But again, you have that similar picture as we have in the domestic demand. If you actually combine the QES data with the recovery tracker data, you see that improvement early on in June, July, and then that marked decline. And we know this because within the chamber, we have an excellent proxy for international trade data. 
which is the number of trade documentation uh, that we process. So compared to the previous year, uh, between March and June, we processed nearly a a one third less documents in 2020 when compared to 2019. Now that has slightly improved uh, since then, but again, what we have is a marked decrease in international trade activity, both nationally and in Greater Manchester compared to pre-pandemic levels. And this is down to various facts. Um, number one, supply chains were uh, disrupted as soon as the pandemic uh, struck uh, China. Um, shipping uh, data has been uh, pretty much catastrophic in the second quarter. It has since then uh, started improving. Uh, what that has also mm -hmm. meant is that freight rates uh, have been uh, fluctuating a lot. And so international uh, trade has been affected. And we'll try and get a comment um, and some reactions from uh, Susanna, um, our head of international trade services, uh, later on during the session. Okay, so that's on international demand. Uh, what is the sectoral picture looking like for international demand? Again, a slightly similar story except for construction, but I would probably leave that aside for now. But on manufacturing and uh, services, um, you, you know, there has been that improvement, but again, the story is very similar. Uh, we do have um, that increase earlier on in uh, July, uh, since then it has uh, petered off. Manufacturing uh, balance for export sales is at minus 11. Um, services balance is at minus uh, 25. And then the construction uh, probably doing the weakest, but the construction sector does not actually export goods. Uh, as such, what uh, the construction sector exports is a lot of services, but we also think occasionally foreign investment is uh, classified as uh, exports. Okay, so for export orders, advance orders from overseas customers, the balance for the manufacturing sector is at minus uh, 17. For the services, it's at minus uh, 24. And so the picture is uh, very similar. These balances are still negative and therefore it will not be good news if you are planning to export at this uh, stage. Okay, that's the data from Greater Manchester. Can we verify that using any other open data source? And indeed we can. And this is a drawn uh, from uh, HMRC's uh, UK Trade Info. Uh, what the HMRC publishes is a data broken down by what are called the government office regions rather than by um, local authorities or uh, city regions. So we have data for Northwest rather than for Greater Manchester. So a couple of points to note. One, um, this data is now broken down uh, between EU trade and non-EU trade. Uh, but what you see is that in the first two quarters of 2020, trade with both EU and non-EU is markedly lower than what it was in uh, 2019. Um, and so there is another important uh, thing to bear in mind. Nationally, the UK trades more with non-EU countries than with EU countries. So the proportion is 45% approximately uh, trade of international trade is with the EU. The remaining 55% is with a non-EU. However, the situation is slightly different in the Northwest where Northwest as a region trades more with the EU and less with uh, non-EU countries. And which is why we need to get Brexit right, a trade deal that works for businesses because otherwise our businesses in the Northwest will be badly affected. Anyway, going on to uh, the, the, the more recent impact of uh, COVID. Uh, so we had approximately 8 billion uh, in um, between ex international trade, exports and imports uh, combined. But that again is significantly lower than what it was in the first quarter of 2019. And this 6 billion here is again significantly lower, you know, 25, 30% lower than what it was in the second quarter of um, 2019. We only have data for the second quarter. The data for the third quarter will be available only around November, December. A similar picture for uh, trade with non-EU countries, uh, 7.4 billion in the uh, first quarter of 2019, but that was uh, 7 billion, so slightly lower. Uh, but then th this is where you see that mark uh, decrease, 6.8 uh, 6 billion in the second quarter, uh, but only 5.5 billion in the second uh, quarter of 2020. So international demand and international trade has also been badly affected. Um, also to note in the second quarter, a lot of the imports into the UK were of uh, personal protection equipment, medical equipment, and uh, so on. And so the regular imports have also been affected. Okay. Now on to other uh, macroeconomic indicators uh, from the uh, QES capacity utilization, an extremely important indicator. 
And what this shows is that there is a lot of spare capacity now in, um, uh, in the economy. And this is uh, true for Greater Manchester, but as a national uh, issue, uh, this is extremely uh, concerning uh, because capacity utilization needs to go up for there to be an actual increase in business activity levels. And I use this analogy of throwing a, a rubber ball on a hard surface. And when you throw a ball on a hard surface, it is bound to, there is bound to be a rebound. And I think what we are seeing is that kind of mechanical rebound of the ball bouncing back rather than actual real growth in the economy at this stage. And that I think is going to happen only when capacity utilization probably goes up near that 50% mark. And we have had this affected. So throughout 2019, capacity utilization has been low. And remember, in 2019, we had a lot of Brexit uncertainty. So the sectoral picture now is that the manufacturing uh, sector is doing probably the best of the three groups uh, at nearly 27% capacity utilization. Um, services and construction, both at that 21% uh, uh, mark. But again, you know, the, the increase in capacity utilization between the second quarter and the third quarter is actually, uh, you get a different story when you look at the recovery uh, tracker data. So we had that improvement earlier on in uh, July, and since then actually it has a decrease. So in July, capacity utilization was actually close to 30%. It is now down to 22.7%. And that chart on the right looks at capacity utilization for Greater Manchester as a region. So it is not split into any of the sector groups or by any of the sub-regions. Okay, so that's capacity utilization. And then cash flow, probably the single most important concern uh, for uh, many businesses, and I do apologize, the data labels seem to be on the slightly wrong place, but never mind. Uh, so cash flow, since the end of March, when we were asking businesses about what their concern factors were, cash flow and reduced sales stood out. Now, cash flow is invariably connected with reduced sales, but also the fact that many businesses, suppliers, customers, etc., were closed. And so many businesses found that their invoices were not being paid in time. And as a result, the cash flow positions in the second quarter uh, were actually extremely, again, the lowest on record. But if you had attended the QES uh, Q2 presentation, you would remember that this, these balances, which are now close to minus 60, were actually close to minus 90 in April. And so we hit that minus 90 uh, mark. And at one point of time, 100% of the respondents in a particular business monitor survey, I think it was second uh, business monitor survey earlier on in April, uh, where 100% of the respondents said they had all suffered negative cash flow positions. And so cash flow positions have improved uh, since then for sure. But again, you have that uh, story of that sharp increase earlier on in July, and then that stagnation that has uh, set in. So the cash uh, balances now for Greater Manchester as a whole, the chart on the right, uh, is minus 14.8. Uh, uh, but with regards to the sectors here, uh, manufacturing, again, doing better of the three groups, with a balance of uh, close to minus uh, five. Uh, construction is uh, the lowest, uh, close to minus uh, 30. Now, this is a particular concern uh, for uh, construction. And... Um, now, if there are construction uh, uh, businesses who are concerned about margins, they are also concerned about cash flow because that's what killed Carillion. And so, you know, the cash flow position within the construction sector uh, must improve. We have had lots of discussions on that, but do bear in mind these balances will have to cross that zero uh, level to actually for there to be a real growth in the economy and for businesses to start thriving and succeeding uh, again. So cash flow positions are compromised at this point and continues to be compromised. So what does this all mean for business confidence uh, then? And within the QES uh, and the recovery tracker surveys, we have two questions on our confidence, turnover and profitability. So the first question asks um, you whether you are confident of being able to maintain revenues during this period. And the second question asks whether businesses are actually able to maintain their margins and profitability uh, at this uh, stage. So in terms of the uh, turnover confidence, again, there has been that improvement uh, between the second quarter and the third quarter. Um, and so the manufacturing and the construction sectors have now breached that zero line and have gone into positive territory. Manufacturing is at 10 and a half, construction is at minus 9.3. But the services sector, again, looming tight at minus uh, 7.4.
However, if you look into the profitability issue, even those businesses amongst yourself who said that you might be able to maintain your revenues into the next six to 12 months, perhaps, you are all even now worried about being able to maintain margins. And so profitability and margins are extremely squeezed at the moment. So for the manufacturing sector, it is at minus 7.7 .7 compared to 10 and a half in terms of uh, turnover. Construction sector, again, profitability in the construction sector has been a concern quite some time. Uh, very low margin, so it's now at minus 14.3 uh, and then expectedly the services sector doing the worst amongst the three at minus uh, 27.2. So business confidence is on the lower side. And what that means is that the prospects for expansion in, um, in business capacity, the prospects for further investment, capital investment in plant and machinery to expand business activities, or even having the, the combination of cash flow and confidence to invest in training the prospects for all of those are at the moment on the lower side. And so unless we have real growth in the economy, we are not going to see uh, an improvement in business confidence and we are not going to see the proportionate increase in business investment and, um, and expansion of uh, capacity. So business confidence, uh, low at the moment. Right, now, now to the big moment of uh, the Greater Manchester Index. So please bear in mind, the Greater Manchester Index is the single most important economic indicator for our city region. This is your key takeaway uh, for uh, today. This number is the magic number. It is one number that shows how the Greater Manchester economy is doing at any one particular quarter. So between the second quarter, when we were at minus 31.7, there has been that increase uh, to minus 9.2. But the reason I didn't mention this earlier on was to actually drive home the fact that when you look at two quarterly data points, it can give you a slightly misleading picture. In this instance, it is easy to conclude that things are starting to get a lot better. But in reality, they are not starting to get better yet. And in fact, you might argue they have actually gotten worse with the more recent announcements about uh, lockdown. But for what it is worth, the Greater Manchester Index for the third quarter of 2020 is at minus 9.2. It is again a very low level. We were at the similar level in the third quarter of 2009, which is when we were starting to see that uh, turnaround uh, from uh, the worst uh, recession that we have experienced in a long, a long uh, time prior to COVID, of course. So what does what did that mean in terms of the national picture? So in the second quarter, GDP contracted, UK GDP contracted by 20.4%. That 20.4% was the result of a near 20% decline in services, a 20% decline in manufacturing, and a 35% fall in construction output. But again, there is another nuance here. Within the services sector group, there was an 87% reduction in business activity within the accommodation and uh, food services. That has never happened in history. I don't think we have ever had a situation where there has been an 87% quarterly decline in any one particular sector in one quarter. So that sudden sharp decline means we have lots to be worried about. And the reason we have lots to be worried about is that within Greater Manchester, the worst affected sectors, hospitality, accommodation and food services, leisure, entertainment, et cetera, account for nearly one third of the employment. So just a retail trade and hospitality account for 24% of employment. But if you look into all of the worst affected sectors, arts, entertainment, leisure, you combine all of that, it's more than a third of employment. And which is why we have some issues with the, with the viability concept that the chancellor was talking about yesterday, but I'm sure we will get uh, to that during our discussion and Q&A session. So declines in the second quarter in all three service groups, uh, construction, manufacturing, and the services sectors, uh, contributed to a 20.4% decline in quarterly GDP. So that decline in GDP meant a significant decline in business confidence. In turn, that meant a 31.4% quarterly reduction in business investment. And this is what I was saying earlier. Unless we have that improvement in economic activity translating to an improvement in business confidence, you are not going to see an improvement in business investment. However, since then, uh, we have had some good news. 
Uh, monthly GDP increased by 6.6% in July, but please do remember we are starting from a very low base. So bouncing balls and hard surfaces again. Um, we have had uh, two, two months of uh, continuous uh, GDP growth in June and uh, July, but even now, despite that, uh, our economy is roughly 20% smaller than what it was at the same time last year. So a fifth smaller than what it was in the third quarter of uh, 2019. So that is actually quite shocking. It did not happen even during the worst of the recession in 2008-2009, a 20% decline in the economy. Okay. Now on to some uh, qualitative stuff as well. Uh, so business concerns. <clears throat> um, and as I said earlier, in terms of the primary concerns for businesses, and the chart on the left tracks this, ever since the end of March, when we did the first business monitor survey, this picture has not changed much. The number one concern amongst um, you business leaders have always been the reduced business volume or revenue. So decreased sales, decreased uh, custom, uh, decreased patronage, etc. Now, automatically, that means there are worries around working capital and cash flow positions. But those are not the only two concerns, of course. Uh, staff availability is a concern for businesses who are exposed to international trade. You see, there has been a massive fluctuation in the value of the pound uh, compared to the euro and the dollar. Um, unavailability of raw materials because of supply chain disruption elsewhere, um, shipping lines being affected. But along with the unavailability of raw materials, the prices of raw materials have also shot up. And of course, the concern around business rates, which is the less said about business rates, the less frustrating for me. So I won't say much, uh, but it is, it is an area which needed intervention. And that is why amongst the first measures announced by the chancellor was this uh, rate relief uh, for small businesses, but also grants uh, for businesses. And then uh, finally, uh, some businesses, okay, 10% or so now, uh, still concerned about the lack of remote working capability, but at its peak, it was close to uh, 25%. Uh, okay, and then um, I said, the unavailability of raw materials and the uh, supply uh, chain uh, disruption caused an increase in the prices of our raw materials as well. And so when, you, when we ask businesses about pricing pressures, inflation pressures, et cetera, 35% said actually they are concerned about the prices of our raw materials coming into the country. So this will particularly affect the manufacturing sector, uh, but it will also affect a lot of other sectors in, in construction and some, some services sectors as well. We know that the, uh, the loan scheme, the business uh, bounce back uh, loan scheme announced by the chancellor was quite a success. What that has meant is that businesses are now over leveraged. They have all taken on debt. Debt needs uh, servicing. At a time when businesses are also facing pressures with regards to uh, commercial um, rent, and we know the challenges that the commercial property sector is under now. But from the tenant's point of view, um, we think the fact that there is a lot of worry now about rent and other uh, outgoings along with that have actually affected this picture. Now, I have never seen the other overheads line at 68%, never before. It has always been hovering around the 20 to 25% mark. And similarly for the raw material prices as well. <clears throat> and so I think this is a kind of a reflection of where we are at in terms of the uh, economy. Okay, so just a couple of other things now um, onto the uh, workforce and labor market data very quickly. Um, so clearly uh, the furlough scheme, the coronavirus job retention scheme is coming to an end on the 31st of October. At its peak, um, nine, I think about nine to 9.1 million workers across the country uh, were on furlough as part of the coronavirus job retention scheme. So by all me measures, it was uh, a success. But one of the issues that we have been considering is, you know, what is the proportion of businesses who are bringing staff back from furlough? And when we asked, so approximately 58% of businesses said they have already brought staff off furlough. And out of that 58%, more 60% said they have actually brought more than 50% of our staff off furlough. 
Now, despite the detail here, this is still a low resolution picture because what we do not know is whether the business is actually saying that they have brought more than 50% of the staff have brought them back for their normal working hours or whether it is just for a day or reduced hours as the case may be. Um, <clears throat> so, but the good news is staff have uh, started coming back uh, from uh, furlough. It's 58% uh, and that, that must mean uh, that it is uh, good news. However, uh, there are some other issues as well, which we will get to during the discussion, particularly with regards to employment prospects um, beyond the coronavirus job retention scheme. And the other thing we have been particularly uh, concerned about um, working with our colleagues at uh, the Transport for Greater Manchester is about uh, staff returning to their normal place of work. The, um, the, the concern here being if suddenly a huge number of staff return to their normal place of work, then utilization of public transport goes up and then the capacity must uh, adjust. Um, <clears throat> I'm, not, I'm, I'm not sure how, how reliable some of these numbers are <clears throat> because the sample uh, size was actually small for this particular question. It was close to, I uh, think, 120 out of the 400 odd responses. Um, but nearly two thirds of the businesses have said that their staff have started coming back to their normal place of work. And out of that two thirds, roughly 60% said, only between 10 and 25% have returned. And that matches the anecdotal evidence that we have gathered that even amongst the larger firms, the large professional services firms, for example, only a very small number of their staff have actually returned to their normal place of work, which in turn has implications for the recovery of town centers and uh, city centers. <clears throat> okay, moving quickly on uh, to uh, the workforce uh, data from the QES. Um, there are two questions. The first question asks, um, have you increased your workforce count in the last three months? And the second asks about recruitment intentions. In other words, do you intend to recruit staff in the next uh, three months? Those balances are again negative uh, for the last three months or uh, they, they are very close to um, zero, uh, you know, beyond margin of error. So for the manufacturing um, sector, it's a two, uh, it's a uh, it's one, construction is 2.8, but the services sector, again, uh, minus 5.7. So no recruitment prospects at this uh, stage. A slightly similar situation here uh, for recruitment intentions in the next three months, except of course for the construction sector. And this is probably a reflection of the fact that uh, the construction sector has actually returned to site and activity is taking place on site. Um, so recruitment prospects are slightly better than compared to the uh, other uh, two sectors. <clears throat> Okay, so that's on workforce intentions. But what does the national uh, data tell us? The national data tells us two things. One is that redundancies are taking place already, and that picture might uh, continue. So you can see the, how the numbers have increased between January 2020 and June 2020, which is the latest data point that I do have access to. <clears throat> Uh, so on average, it has increased by about uh, 50,000, um, you know, both men and uh, uh, women being affected there. But claim and count, which is available at a greater Manchester level, see that increase between March and now. A massive jump in the number of universal credit uh, claimants. In other words, people going on to benefits. This could be for two reasons. One, uh, employment. Uh, but it could also mean a reduction in the number of hours because universal credit can also be claimed um, if the income is below a certain threshold. So it could be reflective of both, but these are the key signals to watch as we go along. You know, claimant counts are going up, redundancies are going up, and I'm sad to say it will probably keep going up um, into uh, the uh, new year as well. <clears throat> okay, uh, retail sales, uh, just a very quick note here, uh, a significant improvement. And as I was saying earlier, when we were talking about domestic uh, demand, uh, between April, which is when retail sales were at their uh, lowest, they have improved significantly. So the index numbers, these are index numbers, anything about 100 indicates uh, growth. Uh, for these two lines, uh, it's at 118, so even slightly better than where it was um, last year. Uh, the other interesting thing which has happened, which I talked about in some detail in the second quarter's QES presentation uh, was on uh, internet sales. Again, simple message here, over the last several months, and in fact, going back to 24 to 30 months, on average, the proportion of internet sales to retail sales was at about 20%. But that went up to nearly a third in May, 
it has since come down uh, to 28.1 percent but here is something to remember overall retail sales have actually gone up and so when we say that 28 percent of overall retail sales now takes place through the online channel it does mean that there has been a significant shift in consumer behavior where a lot of activity is now taking place online rather than uh, through brick and mortar uh, stores okay just some details there about internet sales in uh, pounds million <clears throat> I'll move on uh, quickly to this. So this is our um, demand uh, forecast. And I started uh, uh, pr producing a forecast in the second quarter of June. Um, and what I did at that time, based on the data, uh, it seemed that there would be a kind of a slow, gradual, uh, steady increase in any rate. So first thing to note, the prospect of a V-shaped recovery was never there. What we would have uh, the best case scenario is a gradual steady increase, a sort of a Nike swoosh or tick mark shape of recovery um, between the depths uh, in uh, April and where we are uh, now. So we have had that gradual increase. But as I said, the real increase that we noticed in the business activity levels was earlier on in uh, July. Since then, there has been a stagnation, which is why now we have a best case scenario, which is this green line and a more realistic scenario, which is based on the fact that we have had a, a stagnation in the recent uh, eight weeks or so, but also the fact that there is now the prospect of a further decline in demand because of local lockdowns here in GM. Um, so it looks like we are going to be stuck with this. Now, if we are going to have a situation where the local lockdowns mean a significant decline in demand, then the prospect of a W type recovery uh, becomes uh, more uh, more uh, possible. But uh, the, the key message is this, we are not going to have a rapid recovery. It is going to be a slow and a drawn out uh, affair. That's my presentation. I'm going to uh, end there. I have gone five minutes uh, beyond what I was uh, supposed to, uh, but I will hand over back to Chris. Uh, if you have any questions or if you have any points that you want to discuss, uh, I'll try and answer them and we, will, uh, we can engage in a discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks, Subra, for that. And um, absolutely huge amounts of information and, and numbers and all sorts of things going on there. And I think it's a, a, an absolutely accurate reflection, <clears throat> excuse me, of, of the situation a lot of businesses have found themselves in at the present moment in time. And indeed, the uh, the Greater Manchester and the, and, and the wider economy uh, as it is. I think there's one thing that really does uh, you know, strike out for me uh, for the first time is looking back to the initial slides around um, around demand and, uh, and expectations there and the, the way that the quarterly increase is actually made up of a you know the week by week up down sideways all different sorts of shapes of, uh, of things happening there which is an absolute accurate reflection on uh, on what's actually going on it's a great analogy to think of it a bit like a, a car journey isn't it the qes the greater manchester index is the final destination uh, but the route you take to get there is what's actually indicated by the recovery tracker. So it's so important uh, that people carry on filling out that information. So we've got a real good finger on the pulse uh, as to um, as to what's actually going on. We've got about um, uh, 10 minutes, quarter of an hour or so now for, for any questions from anybody uh, on that. And um, I, I, it's, I just need to um, sort of start off. Somebody you mentioned uh, in in the uh, presentation, and hopefully you've you've got your breath back after uh, a sterling effort for the last forty five minutes. Um, you mentioned in there, and this is something we were having a chat about this morning. This uh, phrase that the chancellor used yesterday around viable jobs. Um, I mean, that's ambiguous. Surely, what is a viable job, and how can you? identify one um I, I don't know if you want to explain a little bit more about that and your thoughts are on it or if anybody's got any comments on that sure uh thank you chris i i have two problems with this with this viability principle the the first one being the chancellor saying that a a business um, will be supported and an employee within that business will be supported if the business is viable is problematic and I say that because if you look into the worst affected sectors, and let's take you know, arts and entertainment, leisure, et cetera, as examples here, businesses in those sectors have been badly affected, not because they are inherently unviable, 
but because they have been rendered temporarily unviable uh, because of the pandemic and the response measures uh, to the pandemic. And I think it is very important to make the distinction between a business that is inherently unviable and something which has been temporarily affected uh, because of this crisis. So that's, that's the first thing. And the, the, the outcome of that means we will have a significant increase in unemployment um, because businesses which are in those sectors, the hospitality, leisure, etc., uh, will probably not be supported by the job support scheme, which is a new scheme uh, to replace the coronavirus job retention scheme, uh, because those employers may not have the demand or the cash flow positions to keep some of those workers um, in the payroll beyond the 31st of October. And we already know that there are numerous examples of um, you know, the arts, culture, et cetera, having uh, uh, announced uh, large scale redundancies in the last uh, few months. The second uh, problem is uh, with that viability is actually trying to equate sectors which have undergone fundamental change and fundamental change which has been going on for quite some time, but has probably been accelerated uh, by this pandemic. And one example would probably be retail. We know that the large retail chains, um, the high street chains, Marks and Spencer, Debenhams, et cetera, uh, have, have had problems. Uh, they have probably not been quick enough uh, to respond uh, to uh, e-commerce um, growth. Uh, they have probably been uh, struck with other problems, uh, such as you know, the, the high property uh, prices and the rents that they have to pay within the city center regions and so on. So to use that lens uh, to view businesses in other sectors which have been affected temporarily, I think is problematic. Okay, that's interesting. And uh, like I said, that that viability, it's a little bit like when um, when they advise you against, you know, essential travel. It, it's open to interpretation and there is no rule book with this, um, with this issue. So again, that, that could be something to, to really watch. And, and building on that, we've got a question from Rupert in, in the chat there. Uh, is, is, he's asking about the in, any intelligence which indicated where most of the redundancy risk could play out and any intelligence on things like insolvency statistics in Greater Manchester, which suggests that the risk is, is rising. I suppose we've all got a bit of a gut feeling about some of this, really, but is there any data that's beginning to come through when we can start to pinpoint the, the key points in, in the next six to 12 months? Okay. Uh, only information that I have gathered from discussions with a couple of insolvency practitioners in the recent past. Um, the insolvency risk is unfortunately not limited at this point in time to the worst affected sectors. And so what insolvency practitioners have told me in the recent past is that uh, there are businesses within the leisure, etc. Obviously, uh, they have been impacted, but uh, small manufacturing companies uh, very small service companies. So I'm thinking of the three, four employee bands who have probably a very small number of clients. Uh, service companies which generate perhaps three fourths or 80% of their revenue from large uh, venues uh, within GM. So think of the suppliers to uh, Manchester Central, uh, Manchester uh, Arena and so on. The, you know, businesses like that are, are being affected uh, as well. When is that risk uh, likely to play out? And I think you know the the, the 31st of October uh, deadline uh, for the coronavirus job retention scheme. I would think it is kind of two to three weeks this side, and and probably four to six weeks the other side, uh, because of the consultancy periods for redundancies. And I think unfortunately we're going to see a reasonably large number of redundancies and job losses here in GM. Okay. Um, I've just put a point in, in the box there if anyone's got any thoughts or comments around the, the Chancellor's announcements yesterday because it's a good um, great opportunity to, to get some direct feedback from business on, on what their thoughts are uh, on that. And one immediate thought, and again, there was a lot made yesterday around the extension to bounce back loans and the various measures that they've, they've got there, both from the point of view of applications, which I think have been extended now to the end of the year, if I understand that right, and also in in the time to repair this sort of pay as you grow uh, bit, uh, which is another sort of uh, catchphrase, uh, government by catchphrase sort of uh, approach that they seem to take. So from your, your point of view, I mean, one of the dangers with this is that businesses are just beginning to store up liabilities, aren't they? Loans still need repaying. VAT 
the deferments still need repaying. Um, so is the Chancellor right in saying we'll give you a little bit longer to do that or could there have been something else that, that, that would have been a little bit more beneficial? Well, uh, for small businesses, clearly the business bounce back loan uh, has been a lifeline. Um, and the fact that it is being now offered uh, to uh, more businesses uh, for a slightly longer period of time is positive. Um, also, the fact that uh, businesses get a longer uh, term uh, to repay the loan in, uh, the fact that they can get a six month uh, payment holiday, the fact that they can choose to make interest only payments at uh, set points of time, uh, those are all beneficial, but I think the key concern, Chris, that you mentioned is, is this issue of being over indebted or over leveraged. Many businesses have taken on a significant amount of loans. And there is a, a distinction between the utilization of the, uh, the CBILs, the coronavirus business interruption loan scheme and business bounce back loans, because the business bounce back loans have been predominantly taken on by smaller businesses. Now, if they do not see that clear path to recovery, then they face two problems. One is that they will take on the debt, uh, but then what about the repayment? And on the repayment aspect, the Office for Budgetary Responsibility recently uh, published a report which said up to 50% of the loan recipients could be defaulting. Now, that was before this extension was granted, so now businesses get up to 10 years uh, to repay. But servicing debt means negative cash flow. So the cash has to leave the business to service uh, debts at, you know, every month um, and, and the regular payments have to be made. So at some point of time, the businesses will have a dilemma as to whether to service debt and whether indeed servicing debt will actually limit their expansion capacity. So those, that is the concern and whether it will lead to even more suppressed growth in the future. Mm. Good point. Um, Clive, Clive's put a, a, um, a comment in there as well um, that, that what's not been mentioned, the short term nature of the intervention compared to Germany and France. I thought it was interesting where the phrase <coughs> Kurzarbeit or, or short work, as, as it's known in Germany, was being used as the model uh, for it. And like a lot of things, we borrow things from these countries without actually having the infrastructure or the context or the culture in place to actually make them work properly. And again, and the great point there is it's failing to create the right environment of longer term support then, isn't it, that, that does instill that, that confidence? Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, the, to, 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 yes, of course. You know, with, with Germany, this, uh, this thing is um, available for up to two years. It's a slightly similar situation in France. And there is an element of short termism in what the Chancellor announced yesterday. And I came across this uh, this morning. We are thinking of the next six months. Germany is thinking of years ahead. So this new website called Germany Works has actually come online yesterday. And it actually showcases Germany's industrial uh, strength, its engineering capability, its innovation capability, etc. And essentially it is saying, despite COVID, Germany is going to flourish and it is going to succeed. And the reason I mentioned that is we need to get beyond this uh, short-term thinking. So the concern uh, you know, uh, uh, from yesterday's announcements is that, okay, you have that support for six months, the job support scheme, but what if this, uh, this virus scenario plays out even longer than that? Mm -hmm. Clearly nobody is expecting economic growth before the end of real economic growth, before the end of 2021. Uh, by that time, there will have been job losses. Uh, there will have been some business uh, failures so I think it would have been best, you know, if, if the chancellor had actually provided a clear kind of forward guidance type uh, measure and said, this is going to be available for up to 12 months or, or 24 months. Uh, it could have even come with some criteria such as, you know, having to prove that there has been a significant reduction in uh, business volumes. But I think uh, Clive is very much right. This uh, short term thinking uh, is not going to do us any favors. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree there. And uh, again, on the chat there, Maria has, uh, has just put a, a link through some data 
on um, on uh, businesses that are considered to be at severe risk of insolvency. Still think around about 11% of businesses uh, stood there. Uh, but again, you know, picking up on that point that you need to do things short term, but you shouldn't just be 100% on that short to medium term. You need something to go into, don't you, as well? And I think that bit does seem to be lacking uh, a little bit at present. I'm just conscious of time. We've just got a couple of minutes left. And one of the other things... Uh, that we've been very heavily involved with and, and has been taxing our minds a little bit, really, is that bit around, uh, you put a slide in there about the public transport and how many uh, people, how many employees are going you know, back into the workplace. I won't say back to work. We've all been in work uh, during the last six months, just in different places. But that, that move back into the workplace is so important. And, of course, this week on Tuesday, we had... Um, I was in the office myself on Tuesday and in, in the space of my commute, the government's advice changed uh, from, you know, going back to work, get back into the office to uh, actually, can you now start working at home again? So anyway, so things do change very, very quickly. We've got a message now from government around, if you can do, please continue to work from home. That does cause all sorts of problems. It just seemed like things were getting a little bit better in, for example, in the city centre and in some of the town centres. What conceivably can you see now happening over the short term? Bearing in mind we've got the 10 p.m. sort of curfew on hospitality. We've still got huge amounts of the leisure and cultural market still shut. And now potentially, if you were thinking maybe going back into the office, the official advice from government is now think again. I can't see any good solution or, or, or a good ending to some of this stuff. No, I think this is this is going to be a sort of a long drawn affair. Um, this is a marathon, not a sprint. I think we have to learn uh, to do two things. One is that this expression has been used many times, which is living with COVID. But what does living with COVID mean? And I think in, in practice, this is what I have noticed in, in, in several countries. As economies start opening up and people start interacting with one another, there will be higher infections. Um, so the question really as a public policy challenge is what is the best way to kind of balance out the, uh, the public health requirements and the economic requirements. So in terms of a particular uh, city center and town center challenges, uh, I think this is going to impact um, town centers significantly more than they might impact city centers. That's my personal view. And I say that because the city centers uh, will recover probably last. They will they'll take time to recover. But unless there is such a shock in future, uh, I don't think city centers will be in the long term badly affected. But what it will do is in that period, okay, for a, for a short period of time, there will be a significant amount of activity perhaps in smaller town centers. So you might go local. If you have to have a 10 p.m. curfew and, and you live in Standish as you do, Chris, you would probably not think of coming to Manchester city center. You would probably go somewhere local. So for a short term, uh, you might see that improvement of an activity within uh, the town centers. But longer term, I think uh, my fear is that town centers might lose out to bigger city centers in GM, but also elsewhere in the country. OK, and on that point, we'll, uh, we'll call a halt to uh, the presentation. Again, some absolutely huge, huge issues uh, coming out of this. I suppose, again, from, from the point of view of, um, of, of the actual you know, presentation itself, the numbers on first glance look as though things are getting better, but when you dig in a little bit deeper and again going off that real in-depth quality information and, and evidence that we're getting from businesses, this isn't stuff that we've made up, this is coming direct from businesses uh, throughout Greater Manchester, it, it paints a very, very different picture actually. As we go into whatever winter may hold over the next five to six months, you know, there's a, a clear steer from government that things will probably get worse before they start to get better. I think it's so important though, that we continue to do the things that have put us in good places in the past and we adapt to them in, in whatever the future may hold. But it's also so important we keep in touch with each other as well and use that support mechanism that we've got within the Greater Manchester business community. That is absolutely vital. So things may get bumpy. We may have to tighten our seatbelts a little bit, but we will get through this stuff. And again, 
please, please, please continue to tell us what's going on, whether that's through a formal survey, anecdotal feedback or whatever it is. Your views are so important because if we know and understand what's going on, we can make sure the people that are making the decisions, whether that's the chancellor, whether that's the mayor, whether that's whoever it is at a real local government level, we can inform them to make sure what they do has the positive and right effect and impact on business within Greater Manchester.